It is the glory of God to conceal a matter. To search it out is the glory of kings. This is the Message to Kings podcast. Episode 138, King Basha to Omri Last regular episode, we covered King Asa and his great beginning and poor end to his kingship. During most of Asa's reign in the north, King Basha ruled and provided an adversary to King Asa. He was just as bad or worse than the previous rulers of northern Israel. And guess what? In walks a prophet. 1 Kings 16 then the word of the Lord came to Jehu, son of Hananiah, concerning Basha. I lifted you up from the dust and appointed you ruler over my people Israel, but you followed the ways of Jeroboam and caused my people Israel to sin and to arouse my anger by their sins. So I am about to wipe out Basha and his house, and I will make your house like that of Jeroboam, son of Nebat. Dogs will eat those belonging to Basha who die in the city, and birds will feed on those who die in the country." So Basha and his entire family are going to face the same fate as Jeroboam's family. And just like Jeroboam, his kingdom only advances to the next generation, and there is an assassination and the death of the entire family line. There is something common in northern Israel. There is a bad king, and he reigns for a good amount of time until he receives the prophetic word of the end of his dynasty. The king dies, and it is his son who lives only a short while before he is assassinated or he meets a poor end. The judgment falls on the next generation of the sinner in the case of many of the kings of northern Israel. 1 Kings 16.8 In the twenty-sixth year of Asa king of Judah, Elah, son of Basha, became king of Israel, and he reigned in Terzah two years. Zimri, one of his officials who had command of half his chariots, plotted against him. Elah was in Terza at the time, getting drunk in the home of Arza, the palace administrator at Terza. Zimri came in, struck him down, and killed him in the twenty-seventh year of Asa, king of Judah. Then he succeeded him as king. As soon as he began to reign and was seated on the throne, he killed off Basha's whole family. He did not spare a single male, whether relative or friend. Check out Josephus' statement about these kings. It's pretty intense. Now by these events we may learn what concern God hath for the affairs of mankind, and how he loves good men and hates the wicked and destroys them root and branch. Looking at the name meanings, I wonder if Josephus was making a reference to their name meanings. Basha means wicked, and his son's name means oak. What a wicked tree, this dynasty was that God destroyed it, root and branch. See, Zimri, who was in charge of half the army of Elah, killed his king, and within seven days of becoming king, he killed off all the descendants of Elah. And this appears to have all occurred within that first seven days of his kingship, before the man in charge of rest of Elah's army returned from campaign in Philistia. The man who was in charge of the rest of the army dropped his military campaign in typical Roman emperor-type fashion and returned with his army to take on Zimri. Zimri prepared to meet Omri, who commanded the remainder of the army, but didn't stand a chance to the grizzled military commander Omri, who was previously successful in retaking some of the Mediterranean coastland from the Philistines. 1 Kings 16.15 in the twenty-seventh year of Asa, king of Judah, Zimri reigned in Terza seven days. The army was encamped near Gibbethon, a Philistine town. When the Israelites in the camp heard that Zimri had plotted against the king and murdered him, they proclaimed Omri, the commander of the army, king over Israel that very day there in the camp. Then Omri and all the Israelites with them withdrew from Gibbethon and laid siege to Terza. When Zimri saw the city was taken, he went into the citadel of the royal palace and set the palace on fire around him, so he died. Because of the sins he had been committing 
doing evil in the eyes of the Lord, and following the ways of Jeroboam, and committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit. All right, so I'd love to research this guy, Zimri, because unless I'm mistaken, he's the only king to kill himself in Israel's history. Well, I guess Saul ends up killing himself, but it's the way that he did it, by burning himself by fire. That's interesting. But hey, he was only king for seven days, so we're moving on. Omri declares himself king, but he must first face off against a new contender for the throne in the name of Tibni. Omni and Tibni will duke it out for about four years until Omri is declared the sole ruler of northern Israel. Omri is credited with building northern Israel's new capital, Samaria. 1 Kings 16.24 He bought the hill of Samaria from Shemer for two talents of silver and built a city on the hill, calling it Samaria, after Shemer, the name of the former owner of the hill. But Omri did evil in the eyes of the Lord and sinned more than all of those before him. He followed completely the ways of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, committing the same sin Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit, so that they aroused the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, by their worthless idols. So there's not a lot to work with on Omri, but there's still much to say about him because of his heritage. There'll be a capital that'll last for centuries and endures many sieges throughout history. And we have to also tribute him with the building up of this city, Samaria, as an excellent fortress, whose walls will withstand many sieges, but will eventually give way to the Assyrians. He said more than all of those before him is a wonderful legacy, and he will be most notorious for his offspring, being the father of the future Ahab and the father-in-law to the horrible, horrible Queen Jezebel. To conclude this episode of Message to Kings, we're going to do a trailer or introduction of the upcoming time period for Israel. Here's a bit of a preview of the upcoming few months of episodes. The richness of the history was a huge surprise as I read ahead. Upon Omri's death, he will have a son whose sole goal in life will seem to be to outdo his father in political achievements and sin. And he will do an excellent job of this by starting by marrying a woman whose name is Jezebel. And she's basically as bad as you get in the Bible. Even as Ahab takes over the throne, Jehoshaphat takes over the kingdom in the south. Contemporaries of each other, Jehoshaphat will leave Judah in revival, while a horrible yet military and politically ambitious king, Ahab, rules in the north. We will see the rise of Aram, northern Israel's chief enemy, with Damascus as its capital. Aram will rise and fall as a nation over the next few centuries, but as northern Israel's chief antagonist, we will see lots of conflict and fighting, and even Aram will not be spared the coming and going of many of the prophet's mercies and wrath. And there's something that's officially dated to around 911 B.C., it's the birth of Adad Narari II, whose birth marks the beginning of the Neo Assyrian Empire. Adad Narari II was the king of Assyria, and he brought a reorganization to the Assyrian state, and he, most of all, conquered Babylon in his reign. And he did something Assyrian kings previously failed to do in the past. In conquering Babylon, he didn't destroy the city, creating a generational enemy but he created a mutual alliance with Babylon, forging the way for the future Assyrian kings to build up a huge power base for empire in Mesopotamia. We will see Alexander the Great and even Cyrus do this, for why would you destroy the commercial city of Babylon? Instead, harness its commercial and industrial might in a bid for empire. With the Fertile Crescent nearly secure, Adad Narai II will set his eyes on the west and Aram, when the far set eye on the riches of Egypt, leaving Israel in their path of conquest. Thus, entering into our geopolitical complexity of Ahab in northern Israel and the revival in the south by Jehoshaphat, we now have a future empire on the rise in the east 
and even the next generation will not be spared conflict. For even Ahab will square off in the great battle of the kings and the battle of Karkar. In the future, for even archaeological evidence points to King Ahab joining an alliance of kings to ward off the Assyrian menace and the terror projection of the Assyrians. Ahab's name is recorded in the histories of the Assyrian kings who opposed the army of Assyria on the Orontes River in modern Syria. The reviews of the victor of the battle are mixed, but the Assyrian story according to Shalmaneser III reads the following. With the supreme forces which Asher my lord had given me, and with the mighty weapons which the divine standard which goes before me had granted me, I fought with them. I decisively defeated them from the city of Karkar to the city of Gulza. I had felt with the sword 14,000 troops, their fighting men. Like a dad, I raid down upon them a devastating flood. I spread out their corpses, and I filled the plain. I felled with the sword their extensive troops. I made their blood flow in the wadis. The field was too small for laying flat their bodies. The broad countryside had been consumed in burying them. I blocked the Orontes River with their corpses as with a causeway, and in the midst of the battle, I took away from them their chariots, cavalry, and teams of horses. Pretty intense. Well, this is the flavor of the history we have before us with the Assyrians, who worship the god of war, whose only answer will be the Prince of Peace. Exciting for the biblical history fan to expand our view of history into the greater context, but there's more. Into our timeline, we get into this rich scene of historic complexity, the walking onto the scene of a sign prophet, not a judgment prophet, as much as a power prophet of signs and wonders named Elijah, who is the representation of the coming one, John the Baptist, who leads the way for the Lord. His showdown with Jezebel's prophets are the stuff of legend, and all of his miracles have representative meetings and incredible stories behind every one of them. And if this isn't exciting enough, we get his successor, Elisha, who operates in double his power and authority. While Elijah operated in the countryside, Elisha will be a king's prophet dwelling in the cities. And with such authority, he will operate even his dead corpse has resurrection power to cause the dead to come to life. Thanks for joining us for this episode of Message to Kings. Feel free to visit the website, messagetokings.com, share the Facebook page, or if you want to chat, email us at messagetokings at gmail.com.